Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Elon Musk claims that Starship is ready to go, but the FAA says otherwise. And meanwhile, in the western region of North America, some amazing developments taking place in regards to Dream Chaser. The Sierra Space Headquarters is on a state of lockdown as their executives and engineers concentrate on getting this ship ready for delivery to NASA and for a launch before the end of the year. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. First up today, we need to talk about Starship. Obviously, this being a very hot topic at the moment because... No sooner did Elon Musk announce that Starship was ready to go, it was stacked, etc., and just waiting for FAA approval, the FAA put out a press release saying that Starship was not yet ready. Really, not even close to ready as far as they were concerned. There is a large number of corrective actions that need to be taken. Some of them may have been taken already, but I really doubt that all of them have been taken to this point before the FAA is going to even entertain a launch. And even after the corrective actions are taken, then SpaceX needs to reapply for their license. So all of that having been said, how long is it going to be before the FAA allows Starship to launch? What all is involved? And just how serious is all of this? Okay, so let's start off with the good news. The FAA has completed its investigation of the mishap that took place on April 20th, or the mishap report that SpaceX submitted to them just a few weeks ago. That's actually very quick work. In addition to that, although they have listed 63 different corrective actions that SpaceX needs to take, it's entirely possible that SpaceX was implementing at least some of those corrective actions before this announcement even came out. However, it's important to note that B9 and S25 were largely completed prototypes before the mishap report was even sent to the FAA, indicating that a number of modifications definitely need to be made to both vehicles before the FAA is going to give the go-ahead. The next few days will be critical. If SpaceX takes the rocket off of the launch pad and takes it back to Starbase, then we will know that extensive work needs to be done. However, if they start doing work on the rocket right on the pad, that will suggest that most of the modifications have already been made. So what are these 63 corrective actions? Once again, the FAA is not really revealing all of the details on this, but the statement at least gives us a few clues. Quote, corrective actions include redesigns of vehicles hardware to prevent leaks and fires, redesign of the launch pad to increase its robustness, incorporation of additional reviews in the design process, additional analysis and testing of safety critical systems and components, including the autonomous flight safety system and the application of additional change control practices." Unquote. Now, SpaceX has included additional details in their own press release, which came out yesterday. Quote, Starship and Super Heavy successfully lifted off for the first time on April 20th, 2023 at 8.33 a.m. During ascent, the vehicle sustained fires from leaking propellant in the aft end of the Super Heavy booster, which eventually severed connection with the vehicle's primary flight computer. This led to a loss of communications to the majority of the booster booster engines, and ultimately control of the vehicle. SpaceX has since implemented leak mitigations and improved testing on both engine and booster hardware. As an additional corrective action, SpaceX has significantly expanded Super Heavy's pre-existing fire suppression system in order to mitigate against future engine bay fires. The autonomous flight safety system automatically issued a destruct command, which fired all detonators as 
expected after the vehicle deviated from the expected trajectory, lost altitude, and began to tumble. After an unexpected delay following AFSS activation, Starship ultimately broke up 237.474 seconds after engine ignition. SpaceX has enhanced and requalified the AFSS to improve system reliability. SpaceX is also implementing a full suite of system performance upgrades unrelated to any issues observed during the first flight test. For example, SpaceX has built and tested a hot stage separation system in which Starship second stage engines will ignite to push the ship away from the booster. Additionally, SpaceX has engineered a new electronic thrust vector control system for the Super Heavy Raptor engines. Using fully electric motors, the new system has fewer potential points of failure and is significantly more energy efficient than traditional hydraulic systems. Now, once again, this is actually very good news. It suggests that SpaceX was aware of at least most of the corrective actions that the FAA was going to be issuing probably before they even submitted the mishap report to the FAA a few weeks ago, and that they have implemented most of the changes on the list of these corrective actions prior to this announcement even coming out. However, that being said, it doesn't mean that the corrective actions that they have taken up to this point are going to actually satisfy the FAA. Keep in mind that SpaceX will need to file for a license modification from the FAA before they can even think about launching, and that cannot be done until all the corrective actions that impact public safety have been carried out, and thus far, SpaceX has not applied for that license modification, suggesting that some work still needs to be done. However, once again, given Given this very detailed and comprehensive press release that SpaceX put out yesterday, it suggests that they have done a hell of a lot of work already to directly address a lot of the concerns that the FAA had and a lot of the things that went wrong on April 20th. However, it's not all good news. The fact that so many things went wrong with this rocket during the flight, and the fact that this thing is nothing less than a giant non-nuclear ballistic missile, well, actually, if it were to blow up in your face shortly after takeoff, it would essentially be the equivalent of a tactical nuclear warhead blowing up in your face. So yeah, a pretty dangerous rocket, given the fact that so many things went wrong, and if they had gone just a little more wrong, that is to say, if the rocket had gone off course a little bit earlier in its flight path and had traveled for 40 seconds in the wrong direction before they could set off the FTS, well, there very well may have been injuries and property damage and maybe even some deaths involved. And remember, the FAA is currently being sued by a wide variety Variety of environmental organizations and other groups concerned about the safety of Starship. And if this rocket was so deeply flawed, and if the launch pad was so poorly prepared for a takeoffs of such a powerful rocket in the first place, then why did the FAA permit it to launch in the first place so close to a heavily populated area? These are the kinds of questions that are doubtlessly going to be asked in this upcoming lawsuit, and something that could ultimately halt the second flight test of Starship if the federal judge adjudicating this case decides to put a halt on future work until a more in-depth, independent investigation can be carried out. That is not beyond the realm of possibility, and that is my one most serious concern about all of the press release that have come out over the last couple of days. Once again, that having been said, though, I have been annoyed, actually gotten really angry over all of the statements about how corrupt the FAA is, about how Joe Biden is trying to stand in the way of Starship's success, about how the government is so corrupt and getting payoffs from Boeing, etc., etc. Everything that we have seen thus far from both the FAA and SpaceX indicates that they have been working together unusually 
closely, unbelievably closely actually. The FAA could be reacting much more aggressively in this situation. They could have chosen to keep this investigation 100% to themselves and not shared anything with SpaceX until it all became public and then let SpaceX flap in the breeze for a little while figuring out about how they were going to implement all of these corrective actions and actually get Starship into orbit anytime soon. That's something the FAA could have done and they're not doing it, obviously. And therefore, I do not think that the FAA deserves anything close to the kind of criticism that they're getting right now. They are clearly an organization that is well disposed towards SpaceX, committed to their success, and they are working very closely with SpaceX to see that Starship ultimately succeeds. But at the same time, they don't want to see anybody get killed in the process. And what the FAA has done up to this point, given what happened on April 20th, is both responsible and efficient, unusually efficient for a government organization. All right, let's move on to Sierra Space and Dream Chaser. Oh yeah, and before I go any further, I'd like to remind you folks that my next tour stop is on Thursday the 14th in Cincinnati from 6.30 to 8.30. All the details on where it's going to be are in the description. $10 if you'd like to attend or $15 at the door. Okay, never mind, enough self-promotion. Let's check out Sierra Space's mini space. A shuttle. A whole lot has happened since this flight test that you're watching right now when Sierra Space, known as Sierra Nevada Company in those days, was competing for the commercial crew program. And given all of the problems that Starliner has had since I started my channel, I think just about everybody would agree that NASA would have made a much better decision if they had gone with this mini space shuttle instead of Starliner, which of course has proven to be a tremendous tremendous disaster. And given the fact that Sierra Space has made so much progress since this time without the billions of dollars that Boeing got for Starliner, well, that's another indication of just how successful Sierra Space has been with this new spacecraft. Although it's not going to be carrying people, at least not at first. Instead, Dream Chaser Tenacity is going to be carrying cargo up to the ISS six separate missions, and the reason that NASA is employing this innovative spacecraft is because it is the best cargo carrier that has yet been designed for resupply in low Earth orbit, assuming it performs as designed anyway. And of course, there's no guarantee of that, but still, the design is both innovative and impressive. First of all, Dream Chaser is capable of carrying more cargo than either Cargo Dragon or the Cygnus resupply ship from Northrop Grumman. It is also 100% reusable, and the reason it can carry more cargo is because it has its own cargo capabilities, of course, plus an enormous amount of cargo in what's called the Shooting Star, which is a self-contained spacecraft. It's not just a cargo pod. It has solar panels, it has its own engines, everything it needs to carry out its own missions. And you can see those cargo pods on the exterior of the Shooting Star. They are capable of carrying much larger cargo than any of the other alternatives can. In addition to that, the Shooting Star is capable of carrying out secondary missions once its primary mission is completed. The U.S. military is actually looking at contracting Sierra Space to use Shooting Star as an independent military surveillance satellite of some kind, or some other sort of tiny space station for the military to be used after the primary mission is completed, thus providing Sierra Space with a lot more money for each mission and making the overall cost of the initial mission less expensive. But here's the biggest advantage that you're looking at right now. Dream Chaser can land on just about any type of airfield. 
that is a lot easier to deal with than an oceanic recovery. And also, it only has one and a half G's worth of re-entry stress on the cargo, which means that the cargo on board, especially sensitive scientific equipment, is going to be subjected to a hell of a lot less stress, and also allowing Dream Chaser to deliver these cargoes to virtually anywhere in the world that has a spaceport prepared for it. Spaceport Cornwall, for example, specifically designed for Dream Chaser and is capable of processing all of the cargo that it could bring down, making it an extremely versatile spacecraft, indeed the most versatile cargo carrying spacecraft in the world once it enters service. And here's the exciting thing, it's about to enter service. Sierra Space has locked down their facility to all tours, to all visitors, while their executives and their engineers hunker down and get ready to deliver Dream Chaser to NASA's Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, where Dream Chaser will be subjected to final testing before it's ready to send to orbit. And once again, the target is to deliver Dream Chaser to orbit by the end of the year, assuming that the second Vulcan Centaur launch can actually take place that quickly. And if it doesn't, well, that's not on Sierra Space. Let's hope that ULA gets their butts in gear and gets ready to deploy this amazingly innovative spacecraft in the next few months. I will keep you up to date on everything taking place, especially given the fact that I'm going to be visiting Denver soon and I'm maintaining constant communication with my friends at Sierra Space. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's incredibly important to the success of my channel. And also please check the description for various ways to support my ongoing tour. And once again, stay angry about space.